So, uh, I know there's balloon fest. We didn't get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go in the balloon. Maybe some of you did. I have not been up in the balloon. <laughs> I don't plan on going anytime soon. But even if we don't get you up in the balloon, that still doesn't mean we can't give you a ticket to race.
we're going to do a tune here right now for you, man. You can get this one on a CD. This is a special song for us because we did it not only in English and Spanish and Portuguese and Italian and Polish and all these other languages, but you can get over here tonight. This is a tune called All You Need Is Blood. Hey, Metallabangers. We're ready to get Metallicast going again. Uh, there we go. All right, Patalabangers, we are back. We are back, finally. And this is episode number... One of 2112. Exactly, it's... Wait, 2112? No. (laughs) What the hell is wrong with me? We're We're talking talking to from the the future. (laughs) This is 2012, and it's our one-year anniversary. One year of podcasting all things Patalica. Started off the show with the song I've Got a Ticket to Ride from Metallica from their very first show ever live in El Paso, Texas at a balloon festival. And you can kind of hear Lenfield talking about the balloons and stuff like that. And then we went into All You Need Is Blood. Now, we have played that before. We actually played it in Korean. So this was the English live version from 2011 at Club Garibaldi in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was a great show. Do you remember that at all? Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, those beer. Really hit me. Hey, we just, again, want to thank all the listeners around the world for keeping up with Patalicast, and hopefully you've been enjoying it. Thanks for listening. We also heard from a Patalicast listener in Australia. Oh, yeah. His name is Ben, and he signed up on the forum. Yeah. And when you sign up on the forum to keep trolls and shit like that away, you kind of have to check in, you know, do a radio check that you're actually a human being and not a bot. So he checked in and said, hey, and he's new to the forum and all that. So I gave, you know, kind of a, hey, welcome, and if you're, uh, need something to listen to, why? Yeah, he turned out to be a bot. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
and then I posted, hey, if you uh, need something to listen to while you're looking around and stuff like that, hey, check out Metallicast. And his response post was, I've already listened to them all, and that's what brought me to the forum, which was really fucking kick-ass to hear. Then I made a post, but haven't heard back from him, that we'd love to have you on Metallicast. So, Ben, from Australia, if you're out there, log back on, and uh, I had sent you a private message. To, uh, I also posted uh, in a thread somewhere that, uh, reach out to me, and Murph Dog and I would love to have you on Metallicast. That would be awesome. We're not going to play Ben by Michael Jackson. No, we will not play Ben by Michael Jackson. <laughs> that is for sure. Other <laughs> things that are going on. Metallica is hosting their first ever festival. It's called the Orion Music and More, and it's going to be at an abandoned airport in Atlantic City in June, the 23rd. 3rd and 24th. I am going to be there and I am going to be up front in the fucking Ultra Pass area. Okay. Oh, yeah. You'll be at home. <laughs> I'm going to bring a guest person with me to, if we can do some interviews and stuff like that with fans, that would be great. Uh, the Nass, he will be along with. Throwing it out there, know there's a lot of people from around the world coming to the Orion Music and More event in Atlantic City. I'm going to be staying at the Tropicana definitely after the shows. Don't know how coherent I will be but after the shows, I am sure there's going to be some bar off the side of the casino somewhere where Metallica fans are hanging out. I'll be wearing a Metallica shirt. If you recognize me and want to come up and say hey and chat or uh, give input, insight, tell us you love Metallicast or tell us you hate Metallicast, whatever, would love to run into you. Got anything else on the docket there, Murph? Mm, I think more beer. More beer. Well, while we're getting more beer, we're going to spin a song, and it is a live song from 2009 in Hamburg, or as some people say, Hamburg. And it is The Battery of James and Yoko. Now, this version of the song, and Murph Dog and I were talking before we got on about second. this. I didn't think we could play this song. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can play this, definitely. Really? And, yeah, right. we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> The Battery of James and Yoko, not only does it kick ass and it's on the Masterful Mystery Tour album, but back in the day and every now and then, I guess it kind of depends on how they feel, in the middle of the song, they'll break down the song and James will start doing an interactive thing with the audience, getting them to yell, Yoko up your ass. He'll yell it out, and then they, the crowd yell back, Yoko up your ass. Since it's not on the album, and people that have seen the band probably haven't heard this version, we thought you'd like to hear it. So here now, again, is The Battery of James and Yoko. Live. <laughs> Live. <laughs> From Germany, 2009. Hey, 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 hey. Talk a second while I tune this fucking thing, all right? Hey. We talk while I tune... Talk a second, okay, that means share what German swear words I know. Torben, du kannst mich uh, leck mich an den Arschlag Krotzweiser, ja? Aber du kannst, What'd you mich, call me? du kannst nicht auf mein Gesicht setzen, ja? I better hurry up. Danke für die Hilfe, ja. I've learned that uh, Atomic Gumi Mushi from Hell, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to show Gert some atomic gummy mushies uh, later on the Hoonestrasse, on the Reaper Bun. Later. Yeah, yeah, later, later. Später, bis später. All the, uh, all the, uh, so the snow bunnies, right? The, uh, you know what I'm saying? Parker Girls. It's like Parker Brothers, like you play with Parker Girls. It's a fun game. And it's us three.
song kicked fucking ass loved it you know it's our one year anniversary we've just been having a blast doing it when we originally started put the first one up and then we decided you know we'd keep going forward we thought maybe every two to three weeks we'd put an episode out well that's insane yeah it took a lot of work <laughs> we have lives aside from Vitalik ass he does <laughs> i'm at home <laughs> call and, me i forget where i was going now you still <laughs> You know, with our last Metallica cast in December, that time of the year, Metallica usually tries to throw in a song or two from their Winter Plunder Band EP. Play the great song that has my favorite little lyrical thing. Let's see if you can do it now, Murph Dog. Record voices ringing out. 
No way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Murph Dog's giving up on that. Anyway, I just, you know, I know it's not Christmas time, but uh, it's like, oh, we're just going to once a year play one song, blah, blah, blah. So I thought I would uh, dig into the archives and pull out from 2009 in München, Germany, or Munich, as other people call it, is a live version, Metallica from Winter Plunder Band, playing Wonderful Christmas Time. Happy Neues Jahr, Alt, is that how you say it? So uh, we're going to do, uh, do a Christmas song to get you in the mood, you know? Because we have a new Christmas EP that you can get here tonight. It's called Winter Plunder Band. And we're going to do a couple tunes off the Plunder Band EP here for you. This one's an old Paul McCartney favorite. Wonderful Christmas time! Here we go! Oh, oh, oh. 
music there, Frank. Well, that was great to hear. Uh, a wonderful Christmas time. I figured, you know, just bust out another one instead of it just being in December when we play a song from that. So for those people out there making your own bootlegs of live Metallica songs from the Metallicast episodes, you can definitely uh, chalk off another live Winter Plunder Band song. Only got two more to go, and uh, maybe towards the end of the year we'll uh, get those out. Hey, Murph, uh, I think it's time to get on the phone. Uh, who do you think we should call this time? I think we should call that. New guy. Maka Mc... Mc what, what, Mc what's his name? I don't know. Oh, McNew Kid. McNew Kid. He is in Milwaukee, I believe. Mr. McNew Kid, are you there? I am. How's it going? Hey, gentlemen. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great to be talking to you. Great to be talking to you. Kind of how we always do with uh, different people here on the Telecast. How'd you get involved, and uh, what's, what's the story? What's the background? How'd you get involved with the band? You know... I've known Cliff for a very, very long time. Uh, 1984 is when I met Cliff. McBurtney? Yes. <laughs> the one and only. 1984, we actually played together in a punk band. Uh, Cliff was playing lead guitar at the time, and I was playing bass. Respectively. That's where I met him. That was, you know, in the mid '80s. There was, you know, a pretty good hardcore punk scene, or it was kind of at the tail of it. And you could actually be 13, 14 years old, learn three chords, and play shows. Isn't that the whole punk scene, though? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a beautiful thing at the time. You know, that's. Uh, I think that's where the hooks got set in for performing live music. So jumping forward, before you get into the band, Murph Dog and I were talking before we got you on, and I think the first time we met you was at Vanux, and there was some Metallica show, yet there was a tie-in, or some reason there were some horror writers there, which you would be. Right, right. That was a kind of a double thing for me, because the other band I play in, Chief, was the opening act that night. Okay, so we did and see was, Chief. And it was a Halloween show. What we did was uh, asked if it would be okay if we had some horror writers come in. And uh, I also write, do some uh, short story horror fiction. So we came in and had a, sold some books there that night as well. Kind of a Halloween tie-in. Okay, yeah. So that was, at first we were thinking, when was the first time we saw you? To kind of set the stage with Metallica, not only you friends with them and everything, but uh, when Cliff became Papa McBurtney, kind of needed to stay near the home and kind of work that whole angle, taking care of his son and stuff like that, you became kind of the fill-in, on-the-road bass player, hence McNew Kid, for Metallica, and we saw you uh, when we flew out to Arizona to uh, go to the beer festival. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Those yeah, were the first hot. shows I uh, I did with those guys. And that was actually before Cliff had the wee lad. Oh, okay. So it was that kind was he was uh, I don't know he was at some Scottish oh, the, clogging right, competition. Right, right. I forgot. Clog <laughs> dancing. <laughs> he, he had some kind of prior commitment. <laughs> show came up, and I, I guess what happened is he had forgotten about the prior commitment, so they had all the contracts signed. And suddenly he couldn't go. <laughs> so they needed someone. <laughs> so they, uh, they hired me, uh, well, so Cliff called me and asked me to call James. I called James, and I explained to him that I thought I could play the bass line. But I don't sing. I have never... <laughs> I've been playing since 84. I never sang at all in any way. <laughs> well, obviously, you could tell my voice. You know, usually when you do a harmony, you want a high harmony, not a low harmony. I tend to sound a little bit more like Bowser when I'm singing. <laughs> so I talked to James, and James is like, don't worry about the singing. Just play the bass lines, and you don't have to do anything at all. I started rehearsing with him, and it seemed like every song then, they'd stop and go, okay, you have to sing this part here. <laughs> I was like, well, what happened? What happened to uh, what happened to no singing? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Welcome. Was, every time we rehearsed, it was like one more part. Oh yeah, and here, and here, you got to do this part too. <laughs> Goddamn motherfuckers! <laughs> they kind of pulled a fast one on me there. But yeah, those Arizona shows were the uh, were the first first two that I played, which was so pretty was, good. That was you... kind of strange because outside of Cliff, the other guys in the band were you know guys that I, I sort of had met in the local music scene, but I didn't really know them well. At all. So it was just a strange experience. You know, I completely remember it, walking, you know, about 10 bases behind them, 
in the airport and looking at them and going, you know, I'm about to get onto a plane to go to a city I've never been to. Stay at a hotel with a whole bunch of swingers. that I barely know headline a festival playing two sets of music that I also barely know. <laughs> so it was kind of a, it was a pretty fun adventure, actually. You guys obviously remember sitting there drinking many really, really small beer. <laughs> yes, we have pictures of them. Yes, I still have both of my mugs. <laughs> yeah, I saved mine, too, so I <laughs> hanging here somewhere. It's not really good for much except for displaying purposes. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe a shot glass. <laughs> yeah, a shot glass. Yeah, what was nice is uh, Murph Dog and I, we, we got a hotel room near the airport, but you guys were swanking it up in a super swanky hotel filled with uh, swingers and stuff like that. So that must have been a fun experience. Yeah, that hotel was awesome, you know. And like I said, I hadn't been down there to the southwest much before that. It was really nice to be able to go out of your room, reach over to the lime tree, and pluck a lime to put in your Corona. (laughs) (laughs) You you don't get to do that in Wisconsin. There's no lime trees around here. You can go out to the cheese tree and get some cheese. (laughs) Oh, yeah, there you go. But I don't like cheese in my beer. With my beer, maybe. But. So those shows were successful, and then uh, we were also talking kind of then, I guess this would actually be post-McBurtney's kid being born, was they had a West Coast run, and Murph and I flew out to see the three shows in the Los Angeles area, uh, hang out there, but you guys did like a little West Coast run, you jumped on board for that, how was that? That was great, that was great, you know, my whole experience with uh, Metallica has been pretty good, those guys are really good good guys to travel with you know there's like no road drama there's no arguing you know it's a real real professional guys in terms of their attitude you may not be able to tell that on stage (laughs) but traveling with them you know those guys are are pros you know the west coast tour was great you know i I did everything that i have always wanted to do musically uh subbing for cliff with metallica because i get to do the tour dates which is what i what i've always wanted to do right but i don't have to do the local shows or the recording. <laughs> so, I, I'm, I am not I'm a studio to, guy. Hey, I don't like nine, 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 nine. nine. <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, you know, that West Coast tour? Was that the, the same one where um, uh, you opened for Steel Panther? Yes. Yeah, at Hollywood. Oh, okay. Now I remember. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a great run. And up the coast, the uh, like the Portland Seattle shows were really good. The way back was a little spotty. I think we played in Billings and Fargo, which it's like not but, necessarily the, the biggest. But still, venues, all all but part of the adventure. All part of the adventure. And of course, the shocking thing is that was uh, it was in November. So we're in Los Angeles, you know, in Vegas, and it's like a hundred degrees. And then, like, four days later, we're, you know, freezing our butts off, you know, the icy cold rain in Seattle, and on our way through Billings and Fargo, I think it was like two degrees in Fargo. (laughs) So that was successful, and you kind of are kind of the standby sub. It's like, hey, we're going to do these shows, we're going to do this, until kind of McBurtney, who's been taking over a lot of songwriting duties and stuff like that in the studio, uh, aside from dealing with the website. And I remember the setup for, I guess it was 2011, when you went over to Europe to do, what, three weeks or something like that. I don't know where I was talking to you about this, but you were basically saying that you really didn't have vacation time at work, but you kind of went to work and said, look, I've got a chance to go do a European tour. I've always wanted to do this, and I really would like to do this. Essentially, you were explaining that if they were to fire you, it would have taken them so long because of the job you have that has to go through background checks and a whole bunch of stuff like that, that it would have taken them longer to find a replacement before you got back, so they essentially let you go and you got to live out your dream. Yeah, that uh, well, that whole situation was repeated for the European tour that also that initially came up even for the west coast tour oh okay okay you know and where i i work they typically uh they don't really like it if you take more than two weeks off at a time even if you do have the vacation time saved up oh okay two weeks is kind of like a maximum so when i first requested the days off my boss at the time um denied the request so I actually just went and talked to her, and I'm like, basically like, here's the deal. Um, I'm not asking if I can have the days off. 
<laughs> what I'm doing is I'm asking you if you want me to come back. I'm telling <laughs> you I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm taking the days off, you know. It's, <laughs> when, when you start daydreaming about touring with a rock band when you're 12 years old and 30 years later the opportunity comes along, it's not something you're going to want to, uh, you're going to easily pass up for for a day job, you know. Right. That, that's my point of view. I, I'm sure some other people would have been like, no, I can't do it. But, but I was like, fuck that, I'm doing it. <laughs> exactly. You get your passport, which I'm sure was exciting. Still uh, harassing Murph Dog over here to get his for the upcoming tour. I had to uh, change my photo because I look different now. Well, he's no longer Grizzly Adams. Now he just oh. looks like 21st century metalhead. You know, I, I think they look at your eyes. Because my uh, my passport photo, I still have a mohawk. <laughs> awesome! And they they didn't uh, cool. they didn't question it at all. They just looked at it and stamped it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking great. So you get the passport. Uh, you obviously have got enough, you know, chops under your belt with the band, at least covering the music, which, just as a quick side note, I thought was fantastic, as opposed to previous quote-unquote new members when members have left the band and someone else has come in they kind of have to start at ground zero and build up you know the set list whereas you knowing cliff i I didn't you i mean lessons sounds wrong but didn't you practice a lot with cliff to understand the songs aside from the band before the arizona shows when they first talked to me i would uh I would like go over to Cliff's house and we would work out the songs and then I would uh, you know go to rehearsal a couple you know rehearsals not a huge number but I would went and rehearsed with the other guys one of the deals with Metallica is if you learn the songs from listening to their CDs you're playing it in the wrong key <laughs> Because most of the time, they change the key for live performance. So, you know, listening to the songs, I'd, you know, listen to the songs and pick up what they were doing and then come in and it's like, oh, no, 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 that, that's just on the recording. The live, show, <laughs> the live show is totally different. Okay, we have just revealed a new secret on Botanicast. I, mean, I don't know if that's a secret. <laughs> well, it's out no, now. Not a very big secret, but... <laughs> You get, you know, sharp as far as performing and stuff like that, and then you get on another fucking plane with these three crazy guys and head over to Europe for three weeks in uh, 2011. How was that? It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Um, You know, that was my first time in Europe, and, I mean, that's really the way to do it. There's always a tour manager taking you around, so, you know, you don't have to worry about getting lost or wondering where you're going. And um, I second you know, that. <laughs> and, and the European fans are great. I mean, the people there, wh- whether they were fans of the band or just people there, were all really, really nice. Vitalik is kind of an interesting band because it's, uh, you know, they have this group of fans that's kind of a community, you know, but, and that's wherever you right go, on, man. wherever you go with them. It's like, uh, you know, it's like the fans are, they're almost like an extension of the band, you know, they're almost like other members who are always around, but, you know, just don't have to be on stage with you, which, you know, it's so, I mean, it's always it was nice to go over there and meet all those people and they were really, the, the European fans were really uh accepting of me, which is kind of, uh, you know, we've had some shows, and I hate to, you know, I hate to say it, but there's nothing like showing up somewhere and having people disappointed just because you're there. Right. (laughs) You know, and there have been a lot of shows where I showed up and people are like, well, where's Cliff? And, you know, James will be like, oh, well, you know, Cliff couldn't make it, you know, here's New Kid, and uh, (laughs) and suddenly, suddenly, you know, the smile falls off their face, and it's just kind of like this, oh, and it's like, oh, 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 fuck you, man. (laughs) You know? Exactly. I drove all this way. I I did the rehearsals. Come on, you got to give me at least give me a chance. Well, right, and it's also not like you just met the band and you've just doing your first show. You've already done this for a while. You know, say Cliff broke his leg and couldn't go, and they needed someone to fill in, and they have the contracts. I mean, when Metallica goes to play a show, most people don't realize it, but they have contracts in place, so they don't get fucked over by the venue or whatever. So when they're committed to do it, they got to 
do it. So if something comes up, they just got to figure out how to do it. Yeah, and we've, um, I've actually, in the time that I've been working with them, have at least in a couple instances, it's been a show where Gerg couldn't make it. Right. And then what happens is I, I still come in and sub on bass. But Cliff then will jump over and play lead guitar. What was it that was in Ohio. Uh, uh, we did that in Ohio, and we did that in that uh, Madison, Wisconsin. We actually went with them. Yeah, we actually uh, went with you guys. Right, went with, right, right, right. Yeah, I remember in, o- that. Right. in Ohio with uh, Mike Portnoy Dream Theater. Exactly. Which was really cool. You know, like, I'm a hardcore Batala banger, obviously. So is Murph Dog. To be able to see the band play, and that was a big show, but be yeah. able to move people around within the band and still kick fucking ass is awesome. So I would be the complete opposite of that person, you know, being totally upset. Oh, where's Cliff? You know, it's like, hey, I get to see something special, you know, something Cliff, different. Cliff was actually there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what I'm saying. Not, not necessarily the Ohio show, but... Well, you know, that goes together with, uh, you know, what I was saying before, that these guys are, you know, some real pro guys even though you wouldn't be able to tell by watching them. But, uh, you know, I'll traveling with them, and, you know, it's something I've always respected about Metallica, even before I started playing with them, is they have a definitely uh, this kind of the show must go on mentality. I, I've played with a lot of bands where all it takes is one guy leaving, and the band is over. Right. You know, but with Metallica, it's like, you know, we're doing this, so if this guy decides that he's unable to do it anymore or wants to leave the band for whatever reason, then, you know, the rounded tryouts start up, and somebody else comes in, and the tour bus keeps rolling, you know? Rock and roll, man. <laughs> so, yeah. uh... Well, getting back to Europe uh, in 2011, uh, did you have fun on the Reaperbahn? Yeah, what did they tell you? <laughs> I want to hear it from you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had fun on the whole tour. <laughs> <laughs> You so don't. There's no need for specifics. You know? Oh, you don't remember we're, that? We're just gonna wash it out as a kind of a nice, <laughs> a nice three weeks on the road. Did you go over to um, uh, across from the mini bar on the Reaper Bond to? Uh, ah, shit, I can't remember it. The heavy. Clichard. Yeah, De Clichard. Did you go over there? Uh yeah, yeah, we did. That's a, that's an awesome place. Oh, man, it, and the funny thing is, is not only is it a cool bar and it's on the Reaper Bond, but it's, like, famous for its fucking jukebox. Total metal. I know, it's insane. It's the craziest metal jukebox probably on the planet. It just, it's all over the place. It's really cool. Yeah, you know, that, that place is, like, the ultimate rocker metal bar. I mean, you know, I mean, every city has their rock club where everything's painted black and, you know, it's kind of a hash place. That's, like, the ultimate hash rock bar. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, wait. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This conversation is taking a tangent, and you're talking about some metal bar jukebox that you have the been country to. that I have never seen or heard. Tell me about Chief, man. How did that happen? Chief. Uh, Chief is a band, a project I've been involved with, oh, I think 06 was when that project started. Um, many, I've been playing for, for a very, very long time in, uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I played with a drummer by the name of Matt, and uh, when I was 15, 16, I used to listen to a local Milwaukee area band called Johnny and the Losers, and I was a huge fan of this band. I mean, I would, uh, I would, I listened to their demo cassette until you know I, I wore the tape out, you know, just turning it over and over and over and listening to it, and uh, kind of copying these bass lines because they were just these phenomenal moving punk bass lines, and uh, cool. This drummer ended up knowing the guy who played bass and sang for that band. He called me and asked if I would be willing to play with them. And, of course, my original idea was, uh, well, what am I going to do? You know, this guy's a great bass player. What am I going to do? And he was like, uh, this guy's We want you to sing. <laughs> well, no. Thank, thank goodness he didn't want me to sing. Chris wanted to play guitar, was going to play guitar and sing, and they needed a bass player. He contacted me about that, and literally, I think a year went by, until finally I actually stopped into the place where he worked, and I was like, what's up with this? You know, you contacted me a year ago, and nothing's happened. After I talked to him, you know, it kicked everything in gear, and like two weeks later, we had a rehearsal, and everything clicked. So we actually, we started... That band was kind of interesting because we pretty much had a CD entirely 
in the can before we even started playing. Really? Which is unusual for something that I've been involved in. You know, Chris had most of the songs written already which was why he wanted to get a band put together. So we were in the studio with Gerg. Gerg was recording that first record. Really? Oh, there's, yeah. a, there's a nice connection. So we did that, started playing, um, <laughs> and I track. really like the music of uh, what Chief does musically. I, he had kind of an argument with those guys, because unlike Metallica, those guys didn't want to tour. What happens is the, me playing in the combination of the two bands <laughs> with Metallica... I get my touring Jones filled. With Chief, I get my, you know, kind of my writing Jones right. taken care of. Because I can, uh, you know, I meet with those guys. and uh, Sounds to me like you're Jones and man. Though Chris <laughs> generally has most of the music written. I'm pretty free with whatever I want to do with the bass line. So I can come in and do whatever I want to. Chief only plays a couple times a year now in Milwaukee. We'll do maybe two or three shows. Actually, the uh, this is really funny. The last time that Murph Dog and I saw Chief, you were on the yeah. road with Metallica yeah. doing the West Coast, and Chief got uh, signed up to open for Thin Lizzy, and since you weren't there, Cliff McBurtney, who lives very close to uh, where the venue was, was able to uh, learn from you or learn the songs or whatever and fill in for you in Chief. So we went up and saw that while you were on the West Coast and saw Chief open for Thin Lizzy, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good situation when you can uh, interchange there. I, I kind of like the story of that where it's like, okay, I'm subbing for Cliff. <laughs> and then he's well, subbing. Cliff is subbing for me. <laughs> on different parts of the country. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, it sounds crazy. But it's true. Well, hey, before we continue, crazy. before we continue this, uh, let's spin a little, Chief. Uh, the first song we're going to hear is "Man Climb." Can you give us a little background on that before we spin that? A uh, man climber. You know, this is one of the early tunes that uh, that Chris had brought in. I, I think it was something he had originally written uh, for another project. Another project that never actually came off the ground. I think he was uh, he was talking with a couple of guys who wanted to do kind of an electronic project uh, called something like uh, I don't know, like the Sexy Dudes or something, you know, <laughs> where they were going to go out on stage in like gold sparkle hot pants and play electronic music or whatever. Oh, I that think that project I... never worked. He brought the demo in to chief rehearsal and it was like okay this is we can totally rock this song <laughs> well let's spin that right now and we'll be right back here is Ma is it man climb or man climber man climber man climber from chief
sexy. It's practically sick. You say you won't be my flame. You gotta light my wick. And you better be goddamn careful. Cause I'm dying on my die. I hope you got the time to explode, honey. I'm gonna burn all night. Ow! All right, well, there was Man Climber by Chief, which kicks fucking ass. Um, you know, I, I was trying to explain to Murph this morning when I got over here that, because uh, I was listening to a couple of your tunes yesterday, I said, you know, don't think of Tim Curry in Rocky Horror, but Tim Curry, the theatrical and musician, because he was a musician and released a couple albums, I totally can see the lead singer, like a Tim Curry's son, want to form a kick-ass rock band or something like that. He's just got this power and essence that adds another layer to the music that I just think is great. I really like it. Yeah, yeah, Chris is, you know, I mean, he's a great showman on stage, too, with, you know, playing with Chief or whoever he's playing with, you know. He definitely knows how to put on a show. So it's not, you know, kind of much like with Metallica, you, you like the music, that's one thing. But when you come see it live, there's a lot of stage activity, you know. It gives you something to, to watch, a real understanding of, uh, you know, this isn't just music, it's entertainment. Right, no, I couldn't agree more. It's not a bash. I, I am a huge Tim Curry fan uh, of all things that he's done, and I kept listening to this song and the other song we're going to play in a little bit, and I was just like, God, I can just see, like, a young Tim Curry just fucking going crazy. I really got so into what's it. What's other song, man? Rain of Rock? Rain of Rock. We're not going to spin it now, but uh, what's the story with Rain of Rock? Because it, it's not, the title of the song's not Vane on Dave's Cock, right? <laughs> it, it might be. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, that actually is a song that I wrote. Oh, cool. And it was uh, basically, I think at the time I, I was listening to something like Metal on Metal by Anvil. And I was awesome. Like, I love that I album. Like, I was like, Chief needs a straight up anthemic rock song about rock. And that's that was the birth of Reign of Rock. <laughs> you know, where it's like, wow. yeah, yeah, we need that. You know, most a lot of those metal bands in the early 80s, they would write songs about metal. <laughs> Yeah, or or about rock, you know, the rock bands, you know, what I think of, what is it, Def Leppard and like Rock Brigade and a lot of those songs, bands back then would have their song or two that were actually just about the music genre or denim and leather, tunes like that. So I want, I thought uh, Chief needed a song about rock. I, I like it, man. I think it's cool. Well, we'll we'll spin that before uh, before we let you go. So, what's Chief doing now? Uh, there, I think uh, you guys are working on new tunes and getting a new album out. Uh, yeah, we're recording. We're recording right now. My favorite. I'm working on that Stonehenge song, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Slaughterstone. Slaughterstone. Our, our nine minute long epic. Uh, that one's actually recorded already. It's just not uh, needs to be mixed and mastered. We have. Uh, you know, another handful of songs. We'll be going back, you know, the studio, I'm sure, before too long to get uh, some of those hammered out. And hopefully, uh, end of this year, early next year, we'll have another batch of recordings that can be purchased or awesome. listened to or whatever. Awesome. Um, now, not that you have enough on your plate, but also, you're an author. And not just what we were kind of talking about as a horror author, but uh, you write a lot of stuff, and I didn't realize until uh, you had sent the links and uh, Murph was talking about it that you write children's books also. Talk about your writing. Yeah, I do. You know, I started, I, I for a while, I completely quit playing music. I was really frustrated. with. Say uh, it isn't so. It's oh, totally so. It can't be. <laughs> it can't be. It's 
true. I, you know, I had played with a band in the Milwaukee area that had been pretty successful in the late 80s, early 90s, and when that band fell apart, I was so frustrated with the idea of starting completely over that I just said, forget it, I sold all my gear. What? Really? I mean, yeah. you were that distraught that you were like, fuck music. Yep, for like four years. This is the first on Metallicast. I sold all my gear, I completely gave up, but you know, uh, it gets its hooks in you. Once you're used to that, it's really hard to completely give it up. Well, before you go on, you know, I think I find that really fascinating that here from, you know, the mid to early 80s, you're totally into music, you get in different bands, and it's just your love for it, and then it comes to a point where you, and you had this dream of, I'd love to tour, and I'd love to do this, and put out albums, and blah, 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 and then finally it comes to a point where you're just like, fuck it, and you get rid of everything. So in essence, at that moment, your dream of touring and all that, they're gone. And then years later, you get back into it and I think are quite successful at it. And then your dreams get fulfilled where you get to tour around the United States uh, to places you'd never been. And then you get to go over Europe and tour. I think that's really fucking cool. Yeah, life, life is interesting. In the gap. Right, right. Back to, back to the writing. My gear, <laughs> I, uh, I, t I tend to be, uh, you know, I needed a creative outlet. I, so I basically I started writing, you know, and I had to, uh, in order to write something I was interested in, I've always been a ha fan of horror in uh, films and literature, and I started writing and I just find, found out that my, my imagination tends to lean that way. You know, when I, when I think of something interesting, all of a sudden, it has to be something interesting covered in blood. <laughs> I'm right there with you, right there with you. So it just, I happen to naturally lean that way. And, uh, you know, just like music, I think anytime you do anything or trying to do anything creative, it's really hard to get uh, a startup. So, I mean, I worked at it and worked at it. I think it took me about nine years to uh, sell my first short story. And after that, I, I sold two of them in pretty quick succession, had them accepted uh, for publication in a small press. Nice. And uh, after I had that success, I started trying to reach out to uh, other authors, started workshopping with a couple of guys locally, and uh, one of those guys ended up being W.D. Gagliani. Okay. Uh, who writes uh, a series of werewolf novels. He was the guy that was with you at Vinux, right? Exactly. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He writes a series of werewolf novels, and at, at one point he was really busy, and he had been asked to submit a story to an anthology that combined music and horror. Nice. And what, what the editors wanted was they wanted writers who were also musicians. Though Bill has a uh, is very interested in music, he, he doesn't actually consider himself a musician, so he contacted me to see if I'd be interested in collaborating with him on this piece. What's the, ti What's the title of it? Uh, the title of it is A Solid Time of Change. Okay. Which is actually, um, it's actually the title of a portion of a song by Yes. Interesting. song, uh, Close to the Edge, and one of the parts of Close to the Edge is called The Solid Time of Change. So that's where we took that title from. We did that, and it, it actually, the collaboration went so well that since that point, really the majority of what I've worked on has been our collaborative fiction. Well, Murph Dog and I just wanted to say, just as a quick aside, when you continue your writing in the future if you'd like to add two crazy metal fans <laughs> into any book or any short story you're more than welcome to use our likeness in print oh well I'm, i was i was waiting until we do the screenplay for the Metallica movie <laughs> oh hell yeah <laughs> you know when we sit down and write that then you guys can play yourself right? <laughs> exactly hey and speaking of horror and authors and everything uh on Metallicast, we've had two physicists and you are number two as far as horror writers, uh, because we also had our good friend Stuart Gordon Stuart, on uh, yeah. back in episode uh, three. So uh, you join the small pantheon of uh, uh, like-minded people. Awesome. It must be a Metallica theme. <laughs> it is. It's all part of the grand design. Well, well, you know, it's not surprising. You know, Metallica is so intertwined with Cthulhu and the Lovecraftian theme. And uh, zombies all kind of tie in there with Metallica, so it's not... Uh, it's not too surprising. Right. And so, uh, finishing off with the books, you got the horror stuff. What's up with this uh, kids' fiction? You know, that uh, that was something we discussed. 
that uh, you know uh, W. D. Gagliani and I had you know always grown up reading and uh, had kind of always both of us upon discussing it had kind of always wanted to uh, write something for kids and uh, you know the, the the kids book is also horror themed you know it, it you know it's not an adult book so it's not very graphic. But it's got, you know, all the classic universal monsters appear in it. It's a horror-themed novel for, you know... Like tweens. Right, right, you know, around right. Around eight, 8 to 12 years old. And, and, you know, older people can enjoy it, too. If you don't mind a book that, you know, doesn't really have any sex or violence. Well, kind of. But yeah, I get your point. I get your point. <laughs> right. And then we used, uh, for that, we wrote a pen, we used a pen name for the kids' right. books. Uh, I, I noticed that. I was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we didn't want, uh, you know, a young person to read that and then turn around and think that they could uh, read one of our more adult pieces of fiction because, you know, our adult fiction is definitely geared towards adults. It tends to be very gratuitous. So unlike Judy Bloom writing a few adult-themed books, you decided, hey, we'll change your name. Right. <laughs> Maybe well, you don't like being name, grouped in with Judy to Bloom. Parents from wanting to kill us. <laughs> you got anything else over there, Murph Dog? I mean, I know I do know. I, I want to hear uh, about uh, upcoming uh, Batalica. You, uh, if and when it happens, are you on the docket going overseas for the next tour? Uh, that I've heard nothing about. Oh, okay. I know uh, I am. Uh, going with them at the end of April. At the end of April and the early part of May, we're doing a little uh, straight run out to the East Coast and back. It'll be like uh, New York, New Jersey. Oh, right, North you're Carolina, playing. Carolina, Kentucky. You guys are playing the F Bomb Party, which I went to the first one uh, last year at the Delancey in New York, which uh, was a fucking great night. Uh, I don't think I went to sleep till about 5 in the morning. Yeah, oh. someone's trying to call in. It's not important. Disregard that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, we got another caller on the line. <laughs> <laughs> the calls are flooding in. They're just get them. <laughs> Fuck them. Uh, question from the audience. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Ben. I have a question. <laughs> um. Hey, we're going to let you go, but uh, before we do, we are going to lead out with Rain of Rock. I'd like to thank you very much for uh, spending uh, some time with us, chatting, and uh, getting a little insight into all things McNew Kid. Totally cool. It was fun. Thanks, guys. Yep. All right. We'll spin Rain of Rock right now. Later.
second I was born that I've got a power inside. It's the fire in my chest, man. It's the venom in my blood. It's the beacon that shines from my fist. It is solid. It is rock. of going with what can we do for our one year anniversary you know we talked to McNew Kid and uh, we played some tunes I am not running around in the parking lot in my underwear you said you would but on your on your chest it would say I heart Batalicast that was the whole part of it (laughs) I'm not going to do it. (laughs) Just as audacious, I dug around in the archives. We talked about it in episode three with Vito C. from JBO. And we also talked about it, I forget the episode number, uh, maybe seven or six. Uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. We also talked about this with Cliff McBurtney. What happened? I'm getting there. In 2009... The final night, final show of the JBO Metallica tour happened in Berlin. And obviously a lot of the European Batala bangers were there, as always. Again, and a great time. Home. You were at home. Something interesting <laughs> happened. And, uh, you know, Vito C gave us a little insight oh, on it. Oh, that's right. I, I do have video sorry. of this. And at some point, we'll put something together because... It's so fucking great. Near the end of Metallica's show, as they went into a Garage Days night when it came to the guitar soloing part, suddenly ACDC guitar riffs and a little banter started appearing out of nowhere. While Metallica's on stage performing, they figured, hey, maybe it's, you know, a CD and this got push play and it's going through the system or whatever, so we'll just kind of play through it and deal with it. And it just kept going on and on and on. So for our one-year anniversary, our lead-out song, we thought we'd leave you with the... Metallica set that got hijacked in 2009, A Garage Day's Night. Thank you. 
Mundo Misterioso.